So I, I actually remember getting the books, the research, um, and being a little scared to call. But, um, but what I did was I, I got on the phone. I said, Dr. Sinatra, hello. <laughs> I'm a fellow in cardiology with your friend. So be nice. Um, and, and really got so much great information from you, Dr. Sinatra. So I want to personally thank you all these many years later for really um, helping me launch my career, which was really about understanding holistically how patients develop heart disease and how we really can prevent it. And what's so interesting about the work you've done and the work that I hope to do is that we really rely on a person's internal structure, internal metabolism, genetics, and, and really understand how to maximize who they are in order to stay healthy and well, and hopefully to prevent disease. So I personally want to thank you. Oh, well, thanks so much. Uh, you know, we have a lot in common. Uh, when I wrote the book, Heart Sense for Women, uh, geez, 20 years ago, um, you know, the problems that we had years ago are still the problems today. And when it comes to um, heart disease, I mean, women need to be treated very differently than men. I mean, just think about it. I mean, women get a delay in angioplasty or in stents. Um, they have a greater mortality, greater morbidity. Uh, the coronary arteries are so much smaller, so their 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 arteries are tougher to navigate with uh, with catheters. And even when I when I was in the cath lab myself, you know, uh, I experienced more complications with women. Uh, so when I wrote my book twenty years ago, uh, I, I realized that someday there'll be a subspecialty in women in cardiovascular disease. I mean, think about it. I mean, what's the group that gets diastolic dysfunction more? It's women, hands down. Well, and most cardiologists yeah. can't even diagnose it today. They, they don't so, even understand it, you know? I will tell you that 20 years ago, I was in the cath lab saying to my colleagues, and this was awful, wait a second, so we're putting a stent in this one area where there's a plaque, but atherosclerosis or blockages in the arteries, that happens throughout the arteries. So are we actually putting a Band-Aid on the area or are we fixing the disease? Right. Needless to say, I got thrown out of the cath lab after that. It was a fabulous experience. <laughs> but I think what you're really pointing to is the fact that 20 years later, we are still really dealing with same of the discrepancies of care and women have a different kind of heart disease. I'm going to tell you this. I I've been a spokesperson for the American heart associations go red for women for 16 years. It only started 16 years ago, but I, we started talking about this 20 years ago and really now have a better understanding of women and heart disease being a disease of the endothelium, the lining of the arteries, that it is diffuse, that the microvasculature, those tiny arteries really get damaged. And you bring up my, my favorite thing to talk about, that women get stiffened heart. Right. And as they age, they don't get heart failure the way that we think of. Right. They get a different mechanism. And the most amazing thing about this is that we can actually prevent this from happening. We can prevent one of the most significant disease processes for women years before. And that's during that perimenopausal, menopausal period. And we can do this through preventive strategies 100%. And I think that that's where we need to sit when it comes to women and heart disease, because as you say, the outcomes are still horrendous. Yeah, and, and a lot of doctors don't get this, but high blood pressure in a woman is a disaster compared that to is. a man, because women get diastolic dysfunction from hypertension. Men do too, but not as much as women. And when they get diastolic dysfunction, later that can you know, correlate with systolic dysfunction. They go into overt heart failure. And it's very sad, but but women need to be treated differently than men. And a Absolutely. lot of board certified cardiologists that are men don't get it. That's the problem. You know what the problem is? 
that this is not taught and it's not discussed. And I have to tell you, listen, we're academic clinicians. We're we're in a, a system where research means everything, which of course it does, but it takes decades and decades and decades to push the needle just a millimeter. So for us to change the whole paradigm of how we think is so challenging. And I, I think what both of us are talking about is the old standard and the old way of looking at things needs to be altered just a little bit because honestly, that little blood pressure that we used to think of as being, oh, it's white coat hypertension, meaning you're nervous in the doctor's office. <clears throat> not okay, not okay. You don't want that at all, that our blood right. pressure goals need to be lower, that it's not okay not to exercise. It's actually not okay. Exercise is a medication. It keeps this blood pressure down. It dilates the arteries. It's not okay to eat bad food. It's just not okay. And we have to really shift how we do think about all of these things. And I was just about to say, well, how do we get the message across to the doctors? Hey, maybe go on a podcast. Thank you for giving me the platform <laughs> really, <laughs> to really talk about it because I think this matters so much. You know, I, I can tell you a story. Uh, when I was in my fellowship in cardiology, um, we were looking at shortness of breath in women uh, because we came from an institution where uh, we had the greatest series on mitral valve prolapse. It was Dr. Gerasati. He wrote the book on mitral valve prolapse. I was his fellow at that time. And wow. I'll, I'll never forget, I did hundreds of uh, phonocardiograms and stuff like that. But the amazing thing about women was back then, is we did not understand why women were getting shortness of breath and why they were getting some ventricular tachyarrhythmias and stuff like that. But it was all due to diastolic dysfunction. Uh, it wasn't even written up in the books back then. And we weren't even picking it up on echocardiography back then. We didn't understand it back then. No. Uh, but, but diastolic dysfunction, in my mind, I think is the greatest, most significant um, uh, hardship that women face today because, again, a lot of doctors don't recognize it. You know, yeah. if, if a woman has a little shortness of breath or a little bit of chest discomfort, you know, somebody may shrug their shoulders and say, oh, she's a little bit hypertensive. I mean, who cares? No. But, but that high blood pressure can pr prove to be a disaster 10 years down the road where she does develop heart failure. Right. And then it's a different ball game. I mean, you're, you know, in, you're in deep trouble. You know? you know what they say, actually? You know what those cardiologists say to these women? You're just anxious. It's in your head. Yeah, it's super tentorial. You're absolutely, <laughs> you're depressed, you're anxious. Right. It must be hard being a mom working. Yeah. Do you know what happens then? They call me and they complain to me. And we spend a lot of time talking about how they're just not listened to. And I'm going to tell you something. It's bad because it, it's maybe getting better. And I see the next generation of doctors maybe are listening a little differently. But to be one of these women who has been vital and feeling great and awesome, and all of a sudden to have these symptoms of shortness of breath and to be ignored is one of the most despicable things that I hear on a regular basis, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not just high blood pressure and, and mitral valve prolapse, no. but, it, but either any infiltrative cardiomyopathy in a woman as opposed to a man presents itself as diastolic dysfunction. And what, what our conventional colleagues need to do, Suzanne, is really understand diastolic dysfunction. They just don't get it. They don't. They don't. I 100% agree with you, but I think it even goes a little deeper than that because before even you see that diastolic dysfunction on echo, which you can yeah. see even before that, you see endothelial dysfunction, right. which is that the arteries aren't dilating. So even before the heart starts getting stiff, the arteries start getting stiff. So here's the thing, for any single woman who has symptoms, whether that's shortness of breath, chest pain, palpitations, I promise you, it's not in your head because no matter what, you're not supposed to feel that way. Right. Exactly. So even though it doesn't mean you're sick, because we like sickness in, in medicine, because sickness we could treat. And so that's the paradigm. It doesn't mean you're sick, but it means something is not right. And I'm going to tell you that you can take care of your own heart. What we need to really understand is it's about dilating these arteries. It's about keeping the heart distensible, pliable. You know, I always think about the marathon runner whose heart doesn't have to beat that fast. It's just, it's just dilates. It's just 
pleasant and calm. This is my living from the heart thing. You have to keep everything very Zen in there. And, and the way to, to do that is by exercise. Cause as I said, I think it's the best medication. It is by eating a really healthy diet. It is also by stress reduction and getting those stress hormones down and decreasing that fight or flight syndrome. And it really is more about understanding that you're in control of this. It's about meditating. It's about breathing. It's about yoga. It's about really being the driver of your metabolism. And we can do that by doing all of these things. No, I absolutely agree.